Welcome back. This is Mrs. Rubright with um, Algebra 1 Honors, and today's lesson is 410, Transforming Linear Functions. All right, so changing the value of b in f of x equals x plus b. So this is really just f of x is y, and this is just saying y equals mx plus b, okay, which is your slope-intercept form. All right, so um, they're just going through what you can do on a graphing calculator. We don't need to do that because you guys are not allowed to have a graphing calculator on the EOC. So do not worry about graphing calculator stuff because um, you don't get one. You can't use one. Therefore, you don't need to know yet. All right, so um, there is a vocab word here, though, the ver a vertical translation. So a vertical translation, translations move things. So it would just be moving something upward, right, shifting up. Shifting the graph up is what a vertical translation is, okay? So, modeling with changes in M and B. So, when you change your slope or your y-intercept, what happens, right? So, a gym charges a one-time joining fee of $50 and then a monthly membership fee of $25 per month. The total cost of being a member is given by this function. So we're saying that the cost equals $25 per month plus the $50 initiation fee. We're T in times in month since joining the gym, okay? So give the situation described below, sketch a graph using this. Okay, so it's going to cost you $50 right off the bat. You have to pay $50 just to join. And then if you're there for a month, it's going to cost you the $25 for that month. So $50 plus $25 is $75. After two months, you've paid $25 twice, you pay $50 plus the $50 initial, so you're at $100, right? So every every month it's $25 more that you've spent, right? Make sense? All right, so the gym decreases its one-time joining fee. Remember, you are not graphing a, sign, um, a specific function for the situation. Rather, you're sketching a representative graph of the function related to the cost, right, the total cost. What change did you make on the graph to obtain the graph you drew? Okay, so it says that they decreased the one-time joining fee. So if they're going to decrease the joining fee, then we're just going to shift this down, right? It didn't say by how much, right? But we just know that we're going to shift it down whatever the reduced amount is. So if the joining fee decreases, we start the graph at the y-intercept of the fee, then use the slope of $25 per month, right? Up 25 over 1, up 25 over 1, up 25 over 1. So if the joining fee was $25, then we would start here and all of our, our line would be here. It would be parallel, right? If it was $10, it would be going from here and it would be parallel. Does that make sense? The gym increases its monthly membership fee. What change did you make to the graph? Okay, well, if it increases its monthly membership fee, say instead of it being $25 a month, now it's $50 a month. Well, then we have our initial fee. And if it's $50 a month, we go up 50 over 1, up 50 over 1, up 50 over 1, and so on. So if the monthly fee increases, the slope increases, and the line will be steeper, right? So here it's going to still be parallel. It's just going to be starting at a lower cost. Here it's going to start at the same cost. There's the same initiation fee. It's just going to cost more monthly, so it's going to be more expensive. You're going to spend more money faster. Does that make sense? Suppose the gym increases its one-time joining fee and decreases its monthly membership fee. Describe how that would alter it. All right, well, if it increases the one-time joining fee, so maybe instead of it being $50, I'm looking like this, right? Maybe it's going to be 
starting up here, right? But if it's going to decrease its, its cost per month, maybe it's only going up a little bit and it's going to be like this. So if you end up joining the gym for a very long time, like say you're there for years, it'll end up costing you less overall, right? Because it's not going to be as steep. So you're going to have a higher initial fee, but then it's going to cost you less like the longer you're there than it would if you were paying more per month. <coughs> All right, so what I would say for this, translate the graph up to show the increase in the one time fee and make the graph less steep to show the decrease in the monthly fee. Suppose the gym increases its one-time joining fee and decreases the monthly membership fee, as in question 3A. That's 2A, not 3A. They're special. 2A. Does this have any impact on the domain of the function, your x values? No. Does this have any impact on the range, your y values? No. Oh, actually, yeah, because of the, the joining fee. Your Y went, no, your Y went up, right? Yes, because of the new joining fee. Right? J-O-I-N-I-N-G. I was missing some letters. Okay. So right here, like, so your X values are still going to be, like, from zero to, like, you know, everything, like all whole numbers, all real numbers, right? All positive numbers. So your Y values, though, initially it started at 50, right? Now it's starting higher. So it's going to be like Y is greater than or equal to whatever the new sign-up fee is. Because your Y values are always going to be higher than that initial cost. So that part did change. Changing the values of A, H, and K in the absolute value function, G of X equals A, absolute value of X minus H, absolute value plus K, can create effects on the graph similar to those to changing M and B in Y equals MX plus B. The graph may move up, up or down, left or right, become more or less steep, and may reflect over the X axis. Okay, so let's look. Graph the absolute value function, the graph of the parent function, is already on here, okay? So this is the y equals the absolute value of x. Okay, because 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, negative 1, 1, negative 2, 2, negative 3, 3. This is your absolute value parent function. So now we're doing plus 2. So if I plugged in a negative 3, the absolute value of negative 3 is 3. 3 plus 2 is 5. 2 plus 2 is 4. 1 plus 2 is 3. 0 plus 2 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 2 is 4. 3 plus 2 is 5. So you're going to have 0, 2, 1, 3. So it's just basically what's going on here. Can you guys see what's happening? It shifted up 2. So this plus 2 shifts up 2. It's a vertical shift of up 2. What happens here? Well, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So I plug in a negative 3. Negative 3 minus 4, or plus negative 4. Negative 7, absolute value of negative 7 is 7. Negative 2 plus negative 4 is negative 6, so that's going to be 6. Negative 5, so that's 5, is 4. 1 minus 4 is negative 3, so that's 3. 2 minus 4 is negative 2, so that's 2. 3 minus 4 is negative 1, which is 1. Okay, so 0, 4, 1, 3, 2, 2, 3, 1, 
negative 1, 5, negative 2, 6, negative 3, 7. So we don't see where it turned yet. So let's go over to here to 4. What if I plugged in a 4? I would have 4 minus 4 is 0, which would be 0. So 4 is 0. If I plugged in a 5, 5 minus 4 is 1. 6 would be 6 minus 4 is 2. So 5, 1, 6, 2. So now you can see where the turn is, right? So if you're just picking random numbers, sometimes you're not going to see where that turn is. So it's important to know what happens based on um, what they do to the parent function. So, I don't know if you guys can see this, but it's been shifted one, two, three, four to the right. Four, right. Shift or translation of four to the right. So, when it's plus or minus inside of absolute value bars or inside of parentheses, it's left or right opposite of what you think. So instead of shifting to the negative direction, you're shifting to the positive direction. When it's on the outside, it's up or down. So plus is up, minus is down. When it's on the inside, it's left and right, opposite of what you think. Shift in the positive direction, four. Make sense? So looking here, this is right four, up two. Right four, one, two, three, four, up two. Right, one, two, three, four, up two. Right, one, two, three, four, up two. It should look like this. And I'm gonna prove that. So knowing that, I know four is my vertex. So I'm gonna go to both sides, five, six, seven, three, two, one. So time tells me where to start, right? So if I plugged in, sorry guys, thank you. So I know, because I went right four up two on all these, I know that this is my vertex. So I'm going to put that in the middle, and I'm going to go to the left and to the right, and I'm going to show you guys this. Four minus four is zero. Absolute value of zero is zero. Zero plus two is two. Five minus four is one. Absolute value of one is one. One plus two is three. Six minus four is two. Two plus two is four. Five, um, seven minus four, three. Three plus two is five. Three minus four is negative one. The absolute value of negative one is one. One plus two is three. 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Absolute value of negative 2 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. 1 minus 4 is negative 3. Absolute value of negative 3 is 3. 3 plus 2 is 5. So I have 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 4, 3, 3, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6, 4, 7, 5. So I literally just shifted right 4, up 2. Right 4, up 2, and so on to each of those points. So I was able to graph this prior to even plugging and chugging because I know my rules. I know that when it's inside of absolute value bars or parentheses, it's left, right, opposite of what you think, shift in the pause direction four, and on the outside, it's up or down, so up two. Yes? So if it's positive four in the absolute value bars, we're then it'd be left. left. Mm -hmm. Yep. How is the graph of f, um, g of x equals the absolute value of x plus 2 related to the graph of the parent function? It has shifted what? What is absolute value of x plus 2? Shifted what? Up 2. How do you think the graph of g of x equals the absolute value of x minus 2 would be? Shifted what? Down 2. Good job. So I know that that's going to look like this. Instead of 0, 0, it's at negative 2, and it goes like this. Right? How is the graph g of x equals absolute value of x minus 4 related to the graph of the parent function? Right 4. So I know that that's going to be, instead of 0, 0, I'm going 1, 2, 3, 4. Up one over one, up one over one, it's going to look like this. How do you think the graph of g of x equals x plus 4 would be related to the graph? Left 4. So it's going to look like this. See how nice it is when you have these memorized? 
So what's this? Right for up to. Right? Shifted right for up to. Right up to. Here's your vertex. And it should look like that. Predict how the graph g of x equals x plus 3 minus 5 is related to the graph of the parent function. So this is going to be what? Left, 3, down, 5. So left, 1, 2, 3, down, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Left, 1, 2, 3, down, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's what it should look like. Let's see. So our vertex should be negative 3 comma negative 5. Let's see. Negative 3 plus 3 is 0. 0 minus 5 is negative 5. Negative 2 plus 3 is 1. 1 minus 5 is negative 4. Negative 1 plus 3 is 2. 2 minus 5 is negative 3. 0, that would be 3 minus 5 is negative 2. Negative 1 is 1, 1 minus 5 is negative 4, negative 5, that would be 2, negative 2 is 2, 2 minus 5 is negative 3, 6 would be negative 3, negative 3 would be 3, 3 minus 5 is negative 2. So 0, negative 2, negative 1, negative 3, negative 2, negative 4, negative 3, negative 5, negative 4, negative 4, negative 5, negative 3, negative 6, negative 2, and there you go. And we just proved that this is, this is um, works, right? So it was shifted left, 3, down, and down, 5. Yes? Uh -huh. In general, how is the graph of g of x equals x minus h plus k related to the graph of, okay, so this is going to be shifted. So if you're subtracting, that's going to be to the um, left, right? Left h and up k. In the negative direction, this is the positive direction, this is the negative direction. Wait, no, you are right. It's opposite of what you think in here. So that's going to be right. Sorry, thank you so much for catching that. It's opposite of what you think, so you're right. It's to the right, H, and then the plus on the outside is up. Right? So it's opposite of what you think with left and right. He's absolutely correct. Thank you for finding that. The rest of you, yeah, uh -huh. I see how much you're paying attention. I am human. I make mistakes. Call me on them. All right, so on 53, write the equation for the absolute value function whose graph is shown. So up 1 over 1. All right, so it's definitely in the normal pattern. So we're just going to the right, 1, 2, up 1, 2, 3. Right, 2, up, 3. So I know it's a plus 3. Is right negative or positive? It's negative, right? So y equals the absolute value of x minus 2 plus 3. So it's translated horizontally, 2, and it's up, 3. So your H is going to be your 2, right? And your K is 3. So G of X equals the absolute value of X minus 2 plus 3. What can you do to check that your equation is correct? You can plug in, you can plug in coordinates, right? Plug in coordinates from the graph to make sure they work.
If the graph of an absolute value function is a translation of the graph of the parent function, explain how you can use the vertex of the translated graph to help you determine the equation of the function. Um, so you would just literally plug and chug. Um, so like if the vertex is h comma k, then the function would be g of x equals x minus h plus k. Suppose the graph in the example is shifted left one unit so that the vertex is at 1, 3. What would be the equation? Well, using the rule I just gave you, 1, 3. So x minus 1 plus 3. Right? Because at 1, 3, it's right 1, so minus 1, up 3. graph this. All right, so what do we know? We're shifted 1 up 1, 2, 3. So our vertex is going to be at 1, 3. Let's check. So if I do that, wait, why did I go in the positive direction, not the negative direction? I meant negative 1. Right, opposite of what you think, opposite of what your brain tells you to do. So I go to negative 1, that'd be 0. 0 times whatever is 0. 0 plus 3 is 3. So that's your vertex, right? What happens if I plug in a 0? I'd have 1. 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 3 is 1. If I plug in a 1, I'd have 2. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. If I plug in a 2, that'd be 3 times negative 6. Negative 6 plus 3 is negative 3. Negative 2 would be negative 1, so that's 1. 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus 3 is 1. Negative 3, that'd be negative 2. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. Negative 4 plus 1 is negative 1. If I plug in a negative 4, I'd have negative 3. 3 times that's negative 6. Negative 6 plus 3 is negative 3. So I have that nice mirroring, which is what I need. So let's plug these in. Negative 2, 1. Negative 3, negative 1. Negative 4, negative 1, 2, 3. If I plug in a 0, I get 1. And we're going to have this nice mirroring going on. Did I go over too far? Oh, yeah, I totally went over too far. I can tell. Hold on. So this is down. One should have been negative one, and two should have been negative three. All right, because these are being reflected over the line x equals negative 1, right? If I folded it on x equals negative 1, they're going to be perfectly on top of each other. All right, so what's going on here? The negative reflects over what? Reflects over what? It, like, reflects over the x-axis, right, compared to where it should be. Okay, this shifts left 1, up 3. All right, so now what's going on with the 2? It's a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. Okay. So, how is the graph related to the graph? All of that. Vertical stretch by factor of 2 reflects over the x-axis, shifts left 1, right 3. Okay, what, it, what happens if I replace 3 with negative 3? Then it would have been down 3, right? So then it would have been all the same thing. All, everything's the same.
but shifted down three instead of up three. Okay, is that making sense, guys? All right, so that is pretty much everything. Your homework tonight is 259 and 260. So do 259 and 260. Have a great day.